All right, uh, let's get started here. Um, hi, my name is uh, Dheeraj Hegde. I'm from Salesforce. Today I'll be talking about our experiences with Hadoop and HBase uh, while running it on Kubernetes. So HBase, as many of you know, is a horizontally scalable database uh, which runs on top of Hadoop, which is a distributed file system, uh, which is again horizontally scalable. Uh, Salesforce has been running Hadoop and HBase in its own data centers for a number of years, almost a decade now. And it has a very large footprint there. It has got uh, literally thousands of machines, uh, billions of transactions per day, uh, you know, petabyte scale of storage being consumed. But more recently, we made a decision to move to public cloud. And as a part of a move to public cloud, we explored other ways of managing and deploying our HBase and Hadoop clusters. And the one that we landed on was Kubernetes. So in this talk, I'll be explaining why we chose Kubernetes and what problems and challenges we ran into with a choice of Kubernetes and how we overcame those challenges. So why Kubernetes and containers in particular too? The number one reason was immutability. Uh, and to understand immutability, we'll first try and understand what mutable deployments are. Uh, with Salesforce, when we were running in our own data centers, we had our own bare metal hosts that we were deploying on and we used traditional tools. And it looked a lot like this. You have a host and a number of different uh, packages that are installed on it. When you're ready to do an upgrade, you basically have to go through each one of those packages in your script or automated process and upgrade them. Quite often what happens is that when you're doing these upgrades on some hosts, one of the packages is left behind. It fails for some reason. And in, when you're dealing with thousands of hosts, uh, it's very hard to f keep track of these failures. So over time, you end up having hosts which have different configurations. And this leads to failures eventually because your packages are not in sync with each other. Another thing that happens is live site issues. You know, you got a big uh, failure going on in your site and people scramble to fix it. And they log into hosts, they make local fixes. Maybe they change the heap size of the JVM or something like that, and they forget all about it. So your host looks a little different from all the other hosts in your data center, and eventually that can cause problems too. So this mutable form of deployment where you can go in and after deploying something, make changes to it or end up with a deployment that's slightly different is not desirable. So with Kubernetes, what you have is a concept of immutable deployment. And the way it is achieved in Kubernetes is that you have a manifest, which is a document where you specify what is it that you desire in terms of deployment? What is the application image name that you want to deploy? Which version you want to deploy? How many instances of it you want to deploy? You take this manifest, which is basically a YAML document typically, and submit it to Kubernetes. That icon of a helm that you see represents Kubernetes in my slide and you'll see it again and again. When Kubernetes receives this request, it deploys a container for you. Uh, and this container, for all practical purposes, is a host by itself. Uh, I mean, in the sense that it gives the impression of being a host. It runs on top of an actual physical host or a VM, but it has its own IP address, so it looks like a host to other entities in the network. And it also has this container image and this container image contains everything that it's supposed to run. This includes the application code that it's supposed to run, the application config it's supposed to run, any system li level libraries even that are needed for it to run. They're all baked into it. And you get it all at one go when you run the container. When you do uh, an upgrade, you go into this manifest of Kubernetes, change its version number to the newer version that you want, submit it into Kubernetes, and automatically Kubernetes will spin up a completely new container, which has the new version of the container image. And the old one is completely destroyed. So you get all or nothing in this Kubernetes-based deployment process. So the, it's sort of an Im immutable way of deploying. No half packages are installed. Uh, no admin can go in and make a change. They can try, but the next time there's an upgrade, whatever they've done gets immediately wiped out because you've got a complete new re, uh, deployment of new container. One other thing to keep in mind is that when we are talking about Kubernetes, uh, we rarely talk about containers. We talk, of, we use this term called pods. Pods is a lot like a container. You can actually, for the purposes of this talk, 
uh, assume whenever I say pod, I mean containers. In reality, pods are a little different. They are more capable. They can actually package many different types of containers into one construct and deploy them together. But that's not important for our talk here. So you can imagine that, that whenever I say pod, I mean container. So that was immutability. The other thing that we really appreciated about Kubernetes was its availability and scalability. And to explain what I mean by that is again, you got a uh, you know manifest here, which says that it uh, would like to deploy a pod, only one replica of the pod, and that's what you see deployed. A pod named A is deployed on a host named A. But if you wanted to scale it up, all you had to do is go in and change the number of uh, replicas that you want and submit it to Kubernetes. Kubernetes immediately deploys all the needed pods. More interestingly, because we are talking about public cloud and all the resources are so elastic and on demand, uh, if you don't have enough hosts to run your pod, the underlying uh, infrastructure in public cloud will scale up to create new hosts or VMs rather and uh, deploy the pods on them. So you got real elasticity at all levels of compute here. Uh, the other interesting thing is that you don't need to do the scaling up manually. There's something called auto scaling in Kubernetes where, you know, basically you deploy a monitoring tool like Prometheus or something, which will monitor your cluster. It will monitor it for the CPU load across all your pods. It will monitor for memory usage across all your pods. You can also do very application specific monitoring, like uh, the number of uh, active handlers in your edge based clusters or in the YARN clusters, you can look for the number of apps that are pending. And when you see those metrics hit a certain threshold, uh, Kubernetes will automatically scale up based on those triggers. And it will just deploy in more pods and also in more, more hosts run those pods if necessary, because that's what the cloud will do for you. And once your, the stress level, the load level on your cluster starts receding, uh, it will automatically scale down, saving you money. Uh, Apart from auto scaling, you also have uh, a high availability that automatically comes with Kubernetes. Kubernetes monitors all your pods. So if something goes wrong with one of your pods, maybe the pod or the host on which it's running, some failure happens, the Kubernetes automatically deploy a new pod and also a new host to run your application. You got automatic failover in that sense. In a real data center with hardware, you know, your old bare metal machines, you'd probably have to provision a new hardware and then configure your software, et cetera, et cetera. None of that is needed in this virtualized environment in the public cloud and using Kubernetes. So, so far we have talked about, you know, uh, compute and how great it is, how it can bob around from one host to another during failures or scale out. But what about storage, right? Uh, I mean, storage is something that has got uh, state in it. And it. how how do you make sure that you make it available as this compute moves around? So that's the nice thing about, again, public cloud. Uh, you know, you uh, using Kubernetes in public cloud, you can uh, you know not only define your pods, which, are, which is a compute, but also storage uh, called persistent volumes in the Kubernetes world, or PVs for short. And you can say that what kind of PVs you want. You can say, I want SSD PVs or HDD PVs and the size like one terabyte here. And all you do is that then submit it to Kubernetes. Kubernetes will bring up a pod in one of the hosts. It will also remember that you requested storage. And the, the request for storage is called a PV claim here. It has a unique name, in this case, PV claim number zero. And when the cloud uh, public cloud provider sees this claim, they automatically carve out an EBS volume. I'm taking the example of AWS here, where EBS is the network attached storage being provided to all the compute. So it carves out a volume of the correct size and the correct type, and then automatically mounts it for your pod. And it's a network attached uh, volume that you're getting here. So if something goes wrong with your host, the pod is destroyed, but your storage is kept safe. It is retained because your claim that um, creates a storage is still present in the Kubernetes metadata. And then when the pod eventually comes up on another host, referring to the same claim, the volume, the network attached storage is once again mounted on the new host and the new pod, and the storage is now available to you. So basically, as your compute is bobbing from host to host for different reasons, maybe because you had to destroy it due to failures or due to upgrade process, your storage will follow your compute wherever it goes. So you got all that availability and scalability. The 
third point uh, and la the final point I'm making here, and it's not very obvious uh, when you start, is that Kubernetes provides you consistency across clouds. Uh, we wanted to deploy our solutions on a number of different cloud providers. And what we found was that, that while there are lots of tools that can talk to all these cloud providers, the code that you write, the manifest that you write, would have to change uh, as you move from one cloud provider to another because they all expose their inner peculiarities. And you have to uh, you know, address those peculiarities. Maybe there are new parameters, different way of managing storage, et cetera. But the thing with Kubernetes is that it's an opinionated platform. It forces everything else to adjust to its uh, requirements. So the way it manages compute, storage, and networking have to be complied with by all these different cloud providers. So they plug in into this framework. So all you have to do is that you have to do manage, create a deployment processes only one way, the way Kubernetes expects it to be defined. And it will automatically work largely the same across all these different cloud providers. And that consistency was really key to why we picked Kubernetes here. So those are all the good things about Kubernetes, but we also had some concerns about it. And one of the concerns was that when we started looking at Kubernetes, it was largely considered a platform that was great for stateless applications. And stateless applications are things like HTTP servers. And you can see an example of that uh, in the slide here, where you got a client, and when the client needs to request a service, it doesn't talk to the actual HTTP servers directly. It talks to the load balancer. And the load balancer then spreads the request around to the backend HTTP servers. So it was pretty easy in the Kubernetes world to create a number of pods that you see here. And uh, those pods uh, were defined by the replicas, uh, you know, saying three replicas of these pods. But if you look at them, their host names are not something very well defined. They're just random numbers and alphabets. And there's nothing in the DNS on the upper right-hand corner, as you can see, there's nothing in the DNS, the cube DNS, that shows uh, information about the pod, what the host name is, what the uh, IP address is. The only thing that it cares about is that uh, the load balancer name and its IP address. But when you look at uh, something like Hadoop, uh, you can see that the context matters here, like the host names and IP addresses matter here. The client, when it is trying to request storage, it first goes to this uh, directory service called name nodes and requests a file name. So it actually needs to know the name or host name of the name node that is trying to contact. The name node comes back with information of which one of the data nodes actually has the data that the client wants. So you actually have to give the host name of the data node uh, to the client. The client then will contact the individual data node. So you can see that this is not a stateless environment where you know you got nameless pods providing services. You've got pods that have very well-defined names. And those names need to be known to the client. And there is storage associated with those names. And the DNS is very key here. The DNS must know all the names and must know, know all the IP addresses of those names. <coughs> Excuse me. So fortunately, Kubernetes came up with this concept called stateful sets. And stateful sets provided this ability to create pods that were not nameless, but that uh, they had actual well-defined host names. So once again, you have a manifest that say, says that I want three pods and a certain amount of storage, but it also says that they want uh, they need to have well-defined host names. That's what stateful sets construct gives you. So the host names are typically the same prefix followed by a number like dash zero, dash one, dash two. So the number keeps increasing based on the number of replicas that you request. And because uh, it is a well-defined host name, the cube DNS uh, keeps very good record, DNS records, both forward and reverse. So you can go from host name to IP address, IP address to host name. All of this is well-defined in your cube DNS. And of course, since you're requesting storage, storage is provided and mounted for you. Now. If you had this pod, like for example, DN0, if it were to fail and move to another host, uh, not only would the storage follow it to the new host, but also it would get recreated by the same host name DN0. So you now have this valuable association between a very well-defined unique network identity and the storage context. It never changes, no matter where your compute is moving in the data center. <clears throat> 
So with that, we were able to very well model our deployments and management of Hadoop using stateful sets. As you can see, you got name nodes that are created and managed using a stateful set. You got data nodes also similarly, uh, uh, you know, managed by a stateful set. And Kubernetes provided this excellent controller called the called stateful set controller, which would create all these pods for you, create all these host names and cube DNS for you, and uh, provide the storage for you, and also support features like rolling upgrades where you want to update uh, one pod at a time. So very important when you don't want to disrupt your services, which is great. You know, the stateful set, uh, set controller was great, but it also came with challenges of its own. Uh, one of its peculiarities was that it did things in a very specific way. It identified pods to upgrade when it was doing rolling upgrades in a very strict sequence. It would start with the highest numbered pod and then the next one and upgrade them one by one. And the key thing is it would do it one by one, which meant that, uh, you know, if you had pods like the big data pods, they take a long amount of time to boot up. They pull down a very heavy image, uh, gigabytes in size, uh, and then they run those images. They provision Kerberos key tabs for them. And the initialization process all can take five, 10 minutes. And if you can imagine, you know, a, a scale out cluster with hundreds of pods and e each pod taking five minutes to upgrade, uh, it quickly becomes uh, a good part of a day before you can upgrade your pod, uh, your cluster. Uh, which is unacceptable for our environment. So what we decided to do was uh, we took advantage of Kubernetes's extensibility. You can literally create your own controllers in Kubernetes. In our case, we created a custom controller, which you see in the bottom of the slide here. Uh, and it took on part of the role, not the entire role of the stateful set controller, just a pa small part of it, which was to identify the pods that need to be deleted. So this custom controller would come in and identify, uh, delete the pods. The And what the stateful set controller would do is that it will notice that these pods have gone missing, and then it will automatically recreate those pods, but it would create them with the updated version numbers. So between these two uh, controllers, we were able to introduce batching, because instead of deleting one pod at a time, this custom controller would delete a whole batch of it. This is all, all our code that we had homegrown. And then the Kubernetes provided controller would do the rest of the upgrade, update process. And in effect, we were able to achieve batch upgrades you, you, by providing this enhancement. Now, this custom controller had other problem solving skills for us. Uh, one of the things you got in Kubernetes is the something called pod disruption budget, where you say that in your cluster of data nodes, you don't want more than two data nodes to become unhealthy. Uh, due to any management activity that you're doing, like an upgrade process. Now, this became a real problem when you already had pods that were unhealthy, as you can see in the slide here. A couple of them are down, and you have a limit of only two being unhealthy. So when you tried to upgrade this cluster, it wouldn't, because pod five, which is a healthy pod, cannot be brought down, because that would make three pods unhealthy. So we were stuck. And now quite often, you're doing upgrades to fix an issue because there's something bad and unhealthy in your cluster. You need to change your config, change your binaries. And you're stuck because Kuba, the stateful set controller wouldn't do it. Now, th thankfully, we had this custom controller. So we could introduce new logic there, which would specifically go after the unhealthy pods first, which is allowed. You can go make unhealthy pod uh, further unhealthy by maybe deleting it. So that's allowed by the rules. And you're then able to upgrade those first. And when you got pretty much all your parts healthy, then you can proceed to the remaining healthy parts and upgrade them. The second use case that we found it useful was for uh, what is quite unique to big data environments, I guess, where you have these clusters like Zookeeper, Quorum, where one of them is a leader, or where you have name nodes where you know, all the name nodes are standby except for one, which is the active one. So there's an elected active or master or leader in a cluster of nodes in these uh, different services. Now, the problem with the default stateful set controller is that it just powers through from the highest number pod down to the lowest number pod. So it would actually go after the one which is currently the leader and disrupt it in effect. Now, the next one that it uh, tries to upgrade might have been elected the leader. So it would, for a second time, disrupt the leader. And if you're really unlucky, uh, even your third pod, which you're about to upgrade, might have been elected the leader. And you end up 
disrupting your leader as many times as you got pods. And this is really bad. Uh, you know, in a short span of time, you uh, repeatedly have re leader re-elections in a very critical part piece of infrastructure. So fortunately here, again, the custom controller was uh, helpful because we could introduce custom logic in it. We avoided the leader uh, and we would uh, upgrade all the other parts and force re-election of leaders only once using this custom controller. So another great uh, functionality that we were able to introduce. So that solved a lot of uh, upgrade pro problems, but then we ran into uh, DNS issues. And the problem is the change in the environment. Uh, in, in your normal data center, DNS rarely changes. You kind of have a host name and IP address and you brought a real hardware into that data center. It's very rare that that host name and IP address changes. And Hadoop sort of came from that environment. So a lot of its code makes the assumption that DNS and IP address does not change often. But if you look at public cloud, and you can see an example of it here, where you've got a host and it's running a pod, and the pod has an IP address. One, two, three, four is a trivial IP address that I use there, not a real one. Uh, but when that pod gets destroyed for whatever reason, uh, and it uh, the first thing that happens when the pod gets destroyed, Kubernetes notices that it's destroyed and it'll update the DNS inside the Kubernetes cluster to say that there's no such DNS record anymore. And then when the pod comes up in its new location with a new IP address, because it's in a new location, it gets a new IP address. It may have the same host name always, because Stateful Set keeps the host names constant for you. But the IP address would change as the uh, container moves from one node to another. So the DNS would then have a new IP address for the same host name. And this really confused Hadoop HBase code when we started deploying it there because it had, all over in its code there were bugs where there's some, uh, those bugs had never been exposed because the DNS records in the traditional data centers rarely changed. Uh, so the only way, uh, what the code would do is that it would resolve the host name or to an IP address or vice versa and then cache that information for a very long time. And the only way you could make it forget it was by killing the process, which is unacceptable you know, because the pods keep going up and down in the public cloud. And the impact of this was most severe in central services like name node, because a name node is the, a nodal point where you know all the data nodes reach out to contact. If its IP address changes and all those data nodes remember it by its old IP address, all of a sudden they start failing because they can't reach the name node anymore. So obviously the solution was that we had to go in and start fixing it, which is what we did. We made contributions to the open source code. Wherever we found these issues, we went in and started patching it. But in the interim, since we had to run a live site, we also took advantage of a feature called service in Kubernetes, which is basically a pseudo load balancer, uh, which allows you to specify a new endpoint, uh, a load balancing endpoint. But in this case, it's not used for load balancing. It's actually used just as a proxy. And the goal was to have a very stable IP address for that service. So even though your pod sitting behind the service keeps changing its IP addresses, the service had a very static IP address and the data nodes knew the name node by that IP address. So there was stability, even though there was change behind that stable front end. So this is something you can think of using if you ever run into issues and you don't have access to the source code to make changes, especially with proprietary applications, you may not have it. Uh, we were lucky we were using open source, so we had that option. So you could use a trick like that in Kubernetes if you want to. So the other DNS issue we had was with DNS replication. So far I've been going on about, you know, how compute moves around, IP addresses change, the host name is magically updated in the cube DNS to keep up with all those changes. But all of that holds true only if your software is running inside the same Kubernetes cluster, which is what you see here. But your client may not be running inside that same Kubernetes cluster. In the real world, your client may be running on some other VMs out there, maybe in a different Kubernetes cluster, especially in a massive company. There are a number of teams. They all run their own Kubernetes clusters. They manage their own services there, but they all cooperate and communicate with each other. So you cannot assume that they have access to the same DNS record. So we quickly found out that we had to make sure our DNS entries end up in the global DNS service of the cloud provider. It's, for example, in uh, AWS, it's called Route 53. So to do that, there's an open source product called External DNS, which will actually pull your Kubernetes DNS and get uh, 
uh, actually not Kubernetes DNS, it actually pulls the, uh, the Kubernetes APIs and gets in DNS information out of it and uh, feeds it into the global DNS service that the cloud provider has got. The problem with that is that it's uh, one, it was only doing it for the forward records. So we had to actually enhance it to do handle reverse PTR records, uh, which basically map IP addresses to host, host names. So they do the reverse of the forward lookup. And we are, the other challenge with it was that there was a little bit of latency there. I mean, it would poll. So it would run every five minutes or so, or every minute or so even. But uh, when it would push the records into the global DNS, the global DNS would take several minutes to spread the records out to their entire data center. So we were never quite sure when the data, the, the DNS records were up there into the cloud and ready. So when we were doing upgrades, like as you can see with data node three here, when it was being upgraded and its IP address was getting changed, we were not sure if its DNS records was correct in the global DNS server. So we had to actually build logic to pull the global DNS service, make sure that all the records were there and only then allow data node three to register itself with a name node and say that I'm ready to take traffic. So this is something you might want to keep in mind when you're doing deployments in Kubernetes and public cloud. Another thing that I wanted to mention was availability zones, uh, a feature of public cloud. Uh, availability zones provide you resilience and high availability. Uh, you can imagine uh, you and your soft in a certain region of uh, the globe, uh, when you deploy into public cloud, it could be US East or US West, uh, could be somewhere out there in European Union, doesn't matter. But even in within those regions, you have a number of different availability zones. Each AZ is very close to each other. Normally they're just buildings within the same uh, campus, uh, but they're just one or two milliseconds away in terms of network latency. But they have independent power, independent network connectivity. So if one of them fails, uh, it doesn't impact the other one. So you got this protection of uh, from failures, things like that. So the desired goal, uh, the one that we went after, is to make sure that our services ran across at least three AZs. So we would spread our data nodes, which hold all the data across three AZs. But that was not sufficient because the name node, uh, which was running, did not know about all these different AZs. So when it created replicas, or replicas are basically copies of data here, uh, and you typically create three copies so that even if one machine dies and you lose the data there, you got two other copies. So you typically create three, but you can create more, as many as you want, but we had three. Uh, but that replica creation was not intelligent. It didn't spread it out equally. Uh, but luckily in, uh, in Hadoop, there's a feature called uh, you know topology uh, which allows you to specify what racks your hosts are running on. So it was rack topology. So we modeled our AZs to be three independent racks and we provide information about all the pods that are running in a cluster, what AZs they're running on. And we said that they're running on three, three different racks. And once the name node had this information, it was then able to properly distribute the replicas across different AZs. Um, more interestingly, when you had checked clients accessing uh, Hadoop file system. In this case, this is an HBase region server, which is behaving like a client. Because the HBase region server's topology information was also with the name node. It was the name node was able to direct it to the data node, which is in the same AZ when you're doing reads. And that meant that your network speed was faster. The latency was much lower, number one. Number two, you saved money because Traffic across AZ costs you money. It's actually not a lot, like two cents per gigabyte, but at big data scale, that can quickly add up. So staying within your AZ as much as possible saves you a lot of money. And that was another thing we gained there. And we also ran our name node standbys in every AZ so that if any one of the AZ went down, we still had two other AZs with replicas of data and enough services running to quickly respond to traffic. Uh, finally, uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about authentication and encryption, what we had to do there. When you run in public cloud, uh, you can't assume that the level of encryption that the public cloud provider provides you with is sufficient. Uh, you have to know what your requirements are and come, come up with your own uh, security policies. The one that we came up with uh, was to use Kerberos, which is the you know the native authentication and encryption mechanism that is provided by 
the entire big data stack in Hadoop, HBase, and it's well supported. It's been there for years. Uh, but the problem was that that again was meant more for first party in some ways. A lot of the tooling around that that we could find out there was more meant for the bare metal environment where, you know, in Kerberos, you have the central thing called KDC that you see up on the right hand top corner. And that is the one that provides the secrets called key tabs. These are passwords. Uh, and they need to be distributed to all the services that want to use Kerberos for authentication. Each one would get a unique key tab, which uh, allows it to identify itself as who it is, and then participate in a secure conversation. Uh, now, in the world of pods, where pods are created and destroyed, these key tabs are also destroyed the minute the pod goes away. So we had to figure out how to make sure that key tabs are properly provisioned. The approach we came up with was that in every pod where you have uh, an application running, or in this case, a Zookeeper application, uh, we also run a key tab agent that we created. It's, some, it's a distribution mechanism that we came up with. And we also had a key maker uh, service running uh, in the cloud. Uh, so this key tab agent would reach out to the key maker service, again, a homegrown service, uh, and request a key tab as the pod is coming up. The key maker service would reach out to the uh, KDCs, which is the Kerberos uh, open source uh, server that provides support for the Kerberos logic, whether it is pro creating key tabs or whether it's managing tickets based on the key tabs, all of that is handled by KDCs. Uh, so that would come back with a key tab and would return it back to the pod and the pod would then cache that information, store that information locally for its communication. Uh, one of the interesting problems we ran into is that these key tabs have a lifetime, TTL, and security uh, you know, rules require you to rotate these key tabs frequently. Every few days, you do want to uh, get rid of the old ones and create new ones to avoid compromise or to minimize the window of compromise. Uh, now, we were trying to do that, and we quickly found out that we're doing it wrong because you can't just pull an old key tab out and put in a new key tab because there's traffic running over the wire that depends on those key tabs. So if you pull out the old key tab and refresh it with a new key tab with a new TTL, those, that traffic will start failing. So we realized that we had to keep both the old key tabs and the new key tabs, which is why you see that there's a key tab cache that a key maker keeps, which contains both the old key tab and the new key tab. Uh, and provides all of it back to the application to use. So we ran into all these issues and the, we were able to solve it. But in spite of that, uh, there were other things that we were concerned about when it came to Kerberos. One was KDCs itself. You can run a few instances of it for HA reasons, but if a KDC for whatever reason goes down, um, could be network issue, could be hardware issues, your entire cluster is in trouble because they all use this KDC for the sessions, creation, the traffic. So it's a single point of failure for the entire cluster. And it's not for just one application like Hadoop or something like that. It's Hadoop, HBase, Yarn, and every other service that uses Kerberos would be compromised by this failure. The other problem was debugging complexity with Kerberos. Uh, the kinds of errors you get with Kerberos when things go wrong are so low, low level, it's very, very hard for you to figure out what it is, what's causing it. There's a lot of guesswork and uh, conjecture that goes into figuring out what the root cause of a Kerberos failure is. Uh, the third thing was DNS perfection. Uh, one of the peculiar things about Kerberos is that it needs the DNS records of all the entities that are communicating to be in perfect shape. They, that means the host name to IP address resolution should be absolutely correct because Kerberos would do a host name to IP address resolution. And then it would go from the IP address and do a reverse resolution back to the host name. And it would better land back to the same host name. If there's any asymmetry between those two, uh, Kerberos communication would fail. And as you've seen from some of the things that I talked about, of caching, uh, the DNS replication, the lag involved in the DNS replication, getting DNS perfection was very, very hard in public cloud. And Kerberos made it worse by immediately failing when this thing was ever off. The other thing was that we were using it for not just authentication and authorization. We were also using it for over-the-wire encryption. And when you start using encryption of a very high level, like FIPS compliant encryption, uh, the performance drop was significant. We were at times seeing things like 20 to 30% drop in performance. So there was a big hit that we would have to take by going with Kerberos. So based on that, uh, we decided to move to 
uh, not move, but uh, start uh, deploying some more clusters using a different uh, authentication and authorization mechanism. And that involved TLS. TLS is basically SSL. The new, you know, we call it TLS now because of the enhanced uh, capabilities there. And mutual TLS involves, you know, where, where both the client and the server have certificates. The client, when it's make calling out, it it not only validates the certificates of the server, the server also validates the certificate of the clients, and both make absolutely sure, mutually sure, that they can trust each other. So. Uh, fairly recent uh, in the last couple of years, uh, there's this thing called Envoy that came out, uh, which is a con uh, logic which allows you to uh, wrap any outgoing communication, intercept it, and do things to it. In our case, we wanted uh, it to be wrapped in TLS, uh, secure uh, pipeline. So Envoy would do that for you. And Envoy came out of a company called Lyft, and you can look it up to see what the history is there. And all you have to do is run one of these things along with the application in each one of your pods. And the application, whenever it is calling out, it would be intercepted by Envoy. And that communication, the TCP communication, could be wrapped in a secure TLS session and then sent out. Uh, so literally what you, you could imagine happening is that all communication was going through this uh, bus of uh, secure communication. And to manage all of this complex Envoy instances, uh, an open source pro project called Istio has also come out, which makes it really easy for you to manage all these Envoy containers at scale and configure them properly, define who they can trust and who they cannot trust, what certificates to trust, things like that. And certificate rotation is also well managed so that you can uh, take care of things. So with this, we immediately saw a lot of benefits. Uh, the performance, uh, even though we, uh, we don't have benchmark results to uh, provide at this time, but uh, informally we were seeing significant improvement in performance. Uh, DNS perfection was no longer a requirement because uh, host name validation was not part of, uh, not necessarily part of uh, the authentication process. You can opt for it, but it's not necessary. Uh, you also uh, did not have the cryptic errors that you typically see in Kerberos. Most of the errors we experienced was, were experienced were well, well, well understood. And also there you didn't have a concept of a central KDC server that had to be up and running, providing tickets and things like that for the communications to work. You just needed a bunch of certificates. And as long as you were able to provision these certificates every few days uh, when the TTL was running out, uh, you were fine. So it it was uh, it's definitely the uh, the, uh, the direction that we plan to uh, you know deploy more of a cluster rather than Kerberos because we're seeing some very good results there. So that's pretty much all that I wanted to cover in this session. Um, uh, really, thank you for your time. Uh, I do want to mention that our team is hiring, and as you can see, we work in the space of big data. I have been exclusively talking about our efforts on uh, how we work with containers and Kubernetes and open source tech, uh, not just open source technologies, but also uh, public cloud uh, interfaces. But that's a small part of what my, our team does. We actually actively work on projects that are uh, you know, quite prominent in the Apache world. There's a uh, open source project called Phoenix that was bootstrapped in our team, and that is now a top level Apache project. Uh, so a lot of interesting work around big data happens in our team, and we are always looking for folks who are interested in contributing in that space. So please reach out if you're interested. And that's pretty much all I had. Thank you. I'll pause for some questions here because we've got a few minutes. This is obviously an awkward uh, mechanism. Uh, I'll just watch out for the chat here. Oh, I see. I was looking at the chat, I guess. Okay, so one of the questions was, you know, how many man years did it take you to get your Hadoop on Kubernetes? So 
in any such project, you know, you kind of start off with a prototype phase and then you productize it, right? So when we were in the prototype phase, we had just a couple of people working on it, me included. And uh, it took us around uh, three or four months to get uh, a working prototype that was demoable to the rest of the team and, were, you know, usable for basic testing and things like that. Once we had that prototype working uh, to deal with all the issues that you've seen, you know, problem solving, uh, you know, enhancements to the open source code, to external DNS, finding bugs in uh, Hadoop, HBS, fixing that, that forked out to a number of different people in our team. And you could say that more, as much as uh, eight or nine people were involved in all those different efforts. And uh, I think we overall achieved stability within eight months of go like we were ready to go live with it. Uh, and for us, that involved a lot of heavy testing to uh, benchmarking and things like that. So a uh, lot of things go into productizing. And we had a, a certain standard on security too. So we had to go in and vet our security processes and enhance it. So uh, all those other activities added a lot of time. Getting the basic thing working, just a couple of people uh, and a couple of months seemed to be fine. So the other question was, why did we come up with our own KeyMaker API and KeyTab key agent? Uh, well, you could use the key admin to create the key tab directly. So a lot of this was done for automation. I mean, it is true that you can uh, run, uh, you could, in theory, go into each one of the pods uh, and you know run key admin or write scripts around it. Our way of automating it was to use key tab agents on every one of the containers so that it can go and pull the central services and say, give me a key tab. This, so that's completely automated. And when the TTL on that key tab is beginning to expire, it is again able to automatically detect that and again go and pull and say, give me a new key tab because I need one. And we also wanted a higher level service out there which would go to use key admin to, you know, provision the key tab, but also remember the old key tabs because you might need it because there are sessions going on that reuse the old key tab, massage it together, and then provide that key tab back to the agent. And when it's doing all of this, when it's providing the key tab to the agent, it has to make sure that the agent is who's, who they say they are. So you, there is mutual uh, trust that needs to exist between the key tab agent and the key maker service. And we used, uh, again, mutual TLS there to establish that uh, trust. So uh, you have to have, even when you're distributing key tab, you have to have trust on you know whether you're giving the key tab to the right person or not. So for the, all those uh, higher level trust requirements, the dynamic uh, needs, we had to you know build a lot of the software on top of it. That is why we did it. Uh, if you're looking for other mechanisms, I think there are open source pro projects like uh, Wallet, which are uh, uh, quite good at distributing key tabs, but we ended up doing our own because we felt it would work better for the Kubernetes environment. Another question is, Hadoop is all about data locality. You mentioned EBS volumes or network attack. Did you recognize any slowdown so that's a very interesting question. And I think it really depends upon what you you expect in terms of performance. For us, we went in uh, with the approach that let's benchmark this. We have a certain number of uh, ingestion rate that we want. We want to be able to run a certain set of queries efficiently within a certain number of milliseconds. Are we able to achieve that or not uh, with this network attached EBS volumes? And the answer to that was yes, we were able to do that. Uh, the latencies involved were not significant enough to be a concern for us. Uh, but what we did realize that we had to watch out for was that the EBS traffic is artificially throttled by AWS. Uh, they, depending upon the size of the VM that you're willing to pay for, uh, you get a certain amount of throughput with those EBS volumes. It's usually so something like for the lower cost volumes, uh, lower cost uh, uh, VMs, it would be like at best you get 10 gigabytes per second. There's no guarantee, but uh, the best you can get is 10 gigabytes per second. But then you can purchase um, more expensive VMs that would guarantee 10 gigabytes per second or much more than that. And you can get guaranteed IOPS too. So based on your requirements, if you pay more, you'll get better throughput uh, from EBS. And we didn't have the need. But you can certainly explore that if you find that you're getting bottlenecked by 
AWS, you can pay more. One of the weird things is that when you pay more, you're largely paying for the greater network bandwidth. Um, uh, but uh, your CPUs are also growing. You're getting more memory and more CPU because you're going for beefier VM instances as a result. And if you're running just a data node on those instances, those CPU and memory are not being used that well. So you might want to take advantage of Kubernetes and its scheduling capabilities so that you throw in not just uh, data nodes on those VMs, but also let Kubernetes schedule probably edge-based region servers that are really you know CPU hungry, or you can run YARN node managers on it and let Kubernetes manage scheduling of various different services on that so that you, the money that you're paying for uh, those expensive instances are well spent. So I don't see any further questions. I also realize that I'm out of time now. It's 8.45, five minutes past the hour. Uh, not the hour, so five minutes past the allocated slot. Um, so if there are no other questions, um, I'm going to end this session. Thank you so much for your time.